All right, everybody, the next talk is very interesting. Are we too early for the party? Are we? <laughs> the parents of baking cyber in from the beginning. Please welcome our speakers, Lillian Ash Baker and Steve Bickler. Over to you guys. All right. Hey, Thank you. So we're going to do a quick little introduction of ourselves. My name is Lillian Ash, or Lily. Uh, a little bit about myself. I work for a <clears throat> major airframe manufacturer in aerospace. Um, prior to that, I worked at Collins Aerospace for 15 years, in, uh, primarily in navigation avionics, doing uh, civil certification across support, um, development, test, manufacturing, everything in between. Uh, I also spent a lot of time in a small airplane doing circles a lot of the time. So, Bick? Yeah. Steve Bickler, go by Bick. Like the pens and the razors, cheap, disposable, marginally effective. Uh, 23 years in IT and cyber, most of that was military time, about 21 years now. I also work for a major aerosp aerospace airframe manufacturer. There's two of them. <laughs> and my OPSEC was really, really bad in the, uh, in the bios online, so just don't tell my company um, that that got through. Um, so yeah, so here we are, let's talk. We want to talk a little bit about where we are in our current development with an uncrewed aerial vehicle. So the company that we're working with has done a lot of prototyping and preliminary products, and they're about to do their first civil certification. How many have done civil certification on the airframes here before? Not no NIST, one? not NIST, not your DOD stuff, if any of you guys are govies, like. So doing civil support. cert is a completely different beast than doing any sort of other civil uh, certifications. So we're kind of in the very beginning section of civil certified de product development. Which is to say, they're building a product and we're the cyber cert folks trying to make sure the cybers are right at this point where nobody really knows what they're building or how it's gonna turn out. So, a little bit of a crowd activity here. Please raise your hand. If you have said, if we would have built cyber in early, the system architecture would have been easier to secure. Hands, oh. hands. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. Our uh, operational system would have been better integrated with our security solution. Hands, okay, great, great. Security and compliance measures wouldn't be so expensive. You guys are probably still right on that one, actually. <laughs> the security solutions would integrate better. Okay, all right, okay. good, good, all right. The red team wouldn't be able to get in. Oh, thank God, thank God. I threw that one in there as a, as a test for the audience. Thank God, like, yes, the red team would still get in, but. We wouldn't have been breached. No? No, we're not gonna do that? We wouldn't have had issues meeting compliance. Okay, oh, right, it's okay, okay. it's okay, hey, like, it's okay. This is a safe space, it's, yeah, yeah. It's a safe space. If you don't tell our bosses, we won't tell <laughs> that you guys said it. We wouldn't have had to pay for recovery services. And that's all just real, real easy to say, isn't it? Okay. And one thing that I want to highlight here is that we're talking about compliance uh, quite a bit because in civil certification, compliance through every stage of development is incredibly important is as important as the final certification itself. So, here's our reality. Upper management, of course, is saying what upper management always says, everything's important, especially cyber. So we take cyber real seriously, all right? And then, of course, cybersecurity, we're giving them all the requirements here. Here, here's what we think meets this situation. We also made ourselves Jennifer Aniston because, you know, hot and smart, right? Um, then of course there's the compliance folks and it's, in civil certification there is no checklist. It's all standard. So it's like, you can do whatever you want, but we have a giant manual. So you might want to check that out. And then our product IPTs are, so, so who are you guys? Which the first version of this was, you guys have requirements because that's seriously where our product IPTs were as well, but we've learned over time interacting with them and they're like, so what's a cyber again? Uh, 
that and, happens. And yes, I have fielded that question from some of our product teams. Yes. Oh, IPT, integrated product team. Integrated product team, yes. integrated process team for some folks, but for us it's product team. So this is what we're de dealing with. We have a chief engineer who says, build us a comprehensive cybersecurity solution for our program. But under no circumstances can you interfere with the current development as it's ongoing. It's a paradox, Marty. I'm telling you, it's a paradox. And we've actually had that exact conversation. We were trying to put out a memo that just says, these are the basic cyber things we need you to do for your first development of this airframe. And it's like, OK, I don't like that. I don't like that. Why do I need encryption? Why would anybody want to encrypt a comm link? Things like that. Hey, did that ever get released? No. Okay. No, it never did. Well, actually, no, wait. We just ignored him and we released the letter anyway because nobody's reading it, which gets into the cons, all right? The cons of building cyber in early, especially when you're building it in as early as we are, is everything is variable. So my example on this one is I'm supposed to be the test director, but I'm really just the threat modeler right now while Lily does all the work, which is great for me and not so great for Lily. But everything's variable, so we built this beautiful threat model after requirements were done-ish, the entire architecture changed. Because everything right now is just a block on a diagram. We're not talking about actually having gear or networks done. It's just a block. So it's like, ooh, you gave us a security recommendation. Wait. It's gone. It changed it twice. Yeah, it changed it twice. Um, this, the TLDR, too long didn't read? Yeah, I think we just explained that about our chief engineer. That's pretty much what happened. And then we released the letter anyway and said, hey, we're going to go do this. For all the IT folks in the room, the certification focus over cyber focus, it's a con, but it's also like necessary with civil aviation. Like we, we have to do the certification right. We have to make the certifiers happy, especially because everything's kind of fungible with civil aerospace as opposed to in like the DOD world where I come from where everything's NIST and it's checklist based. So there's a part of that that's there, but at the same time, we all know, I think we all know from the hands before, is like, just because you built a certified solution doesn't mean it's a secure solution. And so that's kind of where we're at. Um, and then I think you probably, most of you, if you've done any sort of early stage development, whether it's IT or some sort of OT system, we're kind of in the way when we're early. Or at least that's what product managers think. We're like, hey, we're, you guys are slowing us down by continuing to show up at these meetings like Lily does and say, hey, have you guys thought about this? Yeah, well, that's going to slow down progress, and we don't want that. Because remember, they plan to have 50 requirements reviewed this week, but now there are 60 requirements because you just dumped your 10 on top of them and right. said, you guys got to go deal with this. Yeah. Um, how agile is your agile? This one is like, everybody does agile differently. So like on the scale of Ayn Rand to Karl Marx, when it comes to agile, we're somewhere around Joseph Stalin. So it's kind of like, if you don't get your tickets done by the end of the sprint, we might purge you forever. <laughs> we'll delete you from the pictures. You'll never be in this program ever again. So like, we're dealing with a pretty agile, or a pretty unagile agile right now. And that makes stuff hard as far as like trying to show like, look, cyber doesn't fit well in agile anyway. OK? So here we are trying to figure that stuff out. And then kind of goes with all of these. If you've got all of that other stuff going on, how do you justify your existence? How do you say you need? We started this, what, almost a year ago now. Yep. The idea was we'd have six people. You're looking at the people. Still the people. Still, still the people, right? We've got beautiful charts that say what we need as far as people and manpower to take this project through till actually flying this thing. And one point that I'll make here, because I have to talk about regulatory and certification compliance, is that this part about justifying our existence, it's justified for us. Yeah, Except there. the CFRs have not been updated to justify our existence, so we don't exist. Yeah. Lily's more positive, so she's going to tell you about pros. So one great thing is that, of course, in product development, especially in system development, the sooner you get your requirements in, the less rework you have across the requirement life cycle, right? This is a very simple V model, uh, a waterfall model that gets used quite a bit. 
Earlier in development means less development costs. Everyone's been saying this for a very long time. Also, when we're talking about hardware cyber requirements, hardware is working on their certified hardware solution very early on. You have to have your, your cyber hardware requirements in early enough to get into initial prototypes. Because if you don't, it's gonna cause respins, it's causing rework, new hardware has to be ordered and developed. That's expensive. You get a chance to actually mature your cyber solution as you go through this process. So as we said, where we started from and where we are today, our thinking has really shifted yes. along with where the architecture is going. So all of our assumptions up front have either been retired or changed into realities. And so now we can go integrate that into our cyber solution as we keep moving forward. Compliance in civil certification is tightly coupled into the cyber solution. We have to produce documentation at some point that says what testing we did at, of the cyber solution in our system. So the better documented that is for regulators, the more proof we have of our tests to, as the system is developed, then the better off we are overall with our certification basis. Uh, there's also a, our focus is with the security solution and compliance in mind. We're thinking about how we're gonna structure our documentation and all of our testing to take what we've done, put it into a package so that when we go to our regulator, <coughs> FAA or FAA delegates, that we can actually explain to them what we've done and where the work came from. Yep. So, how best to secure the beginning? So first of all, if any of you find yourself in this situation, it's not gonna be easy. I think we've already sort of outlined that. And I'll, the big thing is don't expect to be on keyboard. Um, I had, I moved from another program with promises of being on keyboard and doing pen testing and you know, uh, in early process pen testing stuff. Yeah, I'm not doing any of that. I'm not doing any of that. And the thing with civil aviation is. Well, you say that you're not on keyboard, but you're producing a lot of documentation. I make a lot of documents. <laughs> I am really, really good at making documents now. I am the, the highest paid tech writer at our company, I think. Um, which is okay, but like, you know, it's all right. Um, so like, that's a big thing I think for folks is just, just understand if you're in this situation, it's your expertise that's gonna be in, involved. It's not necessarily gonna be your technical skills. It's gonna be using those technical skills to produce a roadmap for them as opposed to being the person who's doing it yourself. Yeah. And we say that, you know, is being early a problem, but we're engaging into these teams. Even though that they may not be coming to us, we're going to them. We're telling them we're here, we're available, we need to work with you. What's been really promising is that there are teams that have been thinking about cybersecurity in their design, but had no one to talk to because they didn't know we existed. So when we roll in and start talking to them, they say, we're scared. We are so scared about the cybersecurity part of this that we overbuilt this. Can you please tell us where we went wrong? And why is it overbuilt? Can we reduce this? Um, and with that, some other teams are better in taking our requirements and our inputs from cybersecurity. We've actually had very positive feedback from these groups of like, we've been able to sit with them, review their requirements, review their models, and get feedback immediately about what they're not doing right and what they're not taking care now, of. Now they are the same people that also changed the diet, changed the entire threat model on us, but at the same time they did it for the better. So like that becomes like the thing, it's like they are engaged, they were thinking about it, they are the most network aware, internet facing, publicly facing thing. It was great to see that they had done that engagement and like, they were willing to talk to us, it was awesome. Governance is good, uh, you know, I jump in there like, as just saying that about our, our team that helped us. Like, we build the processes we can stick to them, right? Like, I'm not a big process guy. I don't like building processes. I'm pretty disorganized. You can ask my girlfriend in the back or my kid. Like, I'm pretty disorganized. But ultimately, when it comes to this business, you gotta, you gotta lay some groundwork, especially when folks don't understand cybersecurity the way 
we in this room or in this profession would on an I, in an IT cybersecurity realm if it was, this was just networks. So you look at the requirements and you build governance processes around that. Requirements, plans, strategies. God, I can't. I got two more to write this sprint. I can't anymore. But ultimately it is good because those things are there and they're there in the beginning and we've given these folks the roadmap which makes our requirements building hopefully a little bit easier, which gets to compliance as the basis for security. I know compliance and security aren't the same. At the same time, if your compliance isn't right, your network probably sucks. Let's just be honest. Like, you got to get the compliance at least kind of right, and then you start doing the security from there. Yeah. Oh, crap, we're going yeah. too slow. Sorry, Lily. <laughs> well, and with that, since you're building out these models and you've had to change the models and you've had to change the models and you've changed the models a third or fourth or fifth time, you can sit there and refine and iterate through those models. It gives you a fresh start every single time to get through the models so that when you do go do your table talk exercises or your threat models, you have something that should be fairly mature overall in the process. It's a good way to work on your assumptions and move through them early. Yeah. So the bottom line is it's better to be early than late, right? So all of, our, all of our assumptions that we said at the beginning when we were all raising our hands, it's all true. Earlier is better. It's just you got to be flexible. You got you to be willing to see that everything may change on you in a, in a whim. And if it, and if it does, you got to be ready to go back to the drawing board and start working your requirements again. Chances are it won't be all the way to the beginning, but it, it might be. It very well could be. Yeah. But with that, in governance, if it's a big company that has a lot of policy and procedures in place, use those policies and procedures to guide the process and keep it going forward. If it's a small startup, you know that your, your governance is going to have to be there to backstop you as things change. You have to use it as some kind of basis point to move forward again. Uh, with that, building relationships with the product teams and also the product or the teams that are built outside of your product. So if there's any sort of support functions or ultimate customers that are going to be taking over your platform at some point, you can bring them in and start building those relationships to understand how they're actually going to start using the product so that your cyber design takes that into consideration. And model what matters, right? So what we found in our first model was super detailed and super expansive. It also wasn't super realistic for what we were dealing with at the time. So if you're going to do your threat model, threat model based on what your actual environment, what you know is tangible, what you can actually sit down and go, for us it's an aircraft and a ground system. Okay, cool. That's way easier to start going down into the, down the road of subsystems and interactions from there as opposed to trying to model out all the external factors that might be in case, in place, I should say. Yeah. And then don't push off your work. Do what you can when you can, right? I write a bunch of policies and procedures right now because that's what I can do right now. And that's, you know, it may not be what we wanted to do, but it's what we're going to do because that's what's needed right now. And management needs to understand that you need flexibility in agile environments. So one of the big problems that we started to experience is siloing. All these different product teams were starting to become siloed within their sprints and their uh, agile teams. We were also being siloed within them. Yep. You know, their answer was, well, go talk to the teams and get them get them to put you onto your sprints, but that's planning work out almost three, four weeks a month, maybe two sprints ahead of time. Because they got their own stuff to do. They're they not have super interested. And vice versa. We have they to have add them stuff. onto our sprints early in order to get them to come participate in our stuff. Yeah. Agile kind of needs to be a little bit more flexible in that where we can pull in individuals and start working between them. Yep. So what you got for questions for us? I know it's not super, we're, we're not, we, knew, we knew it wasn't gonna be super technical hacking stuff, but like, what do you got for us? So Ma'am. Oh. Hello. Okay. Hello. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, okay. yes absolutely. Um, going back to your point about how to navigate conversations with product managers who are pushing, you know, the speed of things, right? It kind of reminded me of this quote, speed is the natural enemy of good security design. How do you, on the compliance side, you know, trying to have these conversations and push, you know, what really are regulations and protocols, how do you, what sort of like social skills do you use in conversations with those product managers, given that 
they're obviously going to push their agenda and their priorities. You have social skills? Other than just, like, you're going to be fined if you don't comply. What sort of, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I think one is happy hour. Yep. That's been a really good thing. Um, The couple times that we actually all meet in person, happy hour has helped. Yeah, so, so like, the, one of the managers that was giving us a lot of pushback, his organization is cyber plus systems teams, governance teams, um, IVNV, IVNV, process. So, like, we're a small slice of his world. We have to prove to him why we're important and why we matter. And the best way to do that is get talking to him about what makes us excited about cyber. Talking to him about DEF CON or B-sides or any other security, RSA, since they're pretty close to yep. that side of the world. Like, getting them in, in interested in this world that they don't understand and why it matters. Um, that's, that's the advocacy piece of it, right? Because we're doing a lot of advocacy for cybersecurity. The other piece of it that comes is, and it's, it's boring, you know, CISSP, SISM stuff, but it's, hey, Here's the risks you're taking, right? We we wrote a memo. They're taking some risks to get to a first flight of this thing. We're like, okay, you don't care about cyber because you want to get this thing flown. Here's a memo that says what we're going to give you for cyber for this first time. But oh, by the way, here's the the list below that is all the things you're not getting, which means your timeline is going to get either really compressed later on, or it's going to be real, you know it's going to take a lot longer than you think. And that goes to that same person, and we've built that relationship with him, and he's like, ooh, I don't like that. I'm like, well, you don't have to like it, but it's kind of reality at this point. And since it is a a civil certified product, and we have to take our documentation through a gated process and reviews with our regulatory reviewers, it means that if our documentation doesn't show up at that review, we don't pass the gate. So it also puts up roadblocks of like, if you want to pass this gate, we have to start our work six months beforehand and make it to that point with everybody else. Yeah, they all have to sign off on a document. For anybody who's done compliance before, they have to sign off on a document that says how they're going to do compliance essentially three to five years before. They can make changes to that document along the way, but they at least have to here is the way to get to the answer, or here's the way we're going to take to get to the answer. And that's an advantage we do have in this regard. It's oh, like that stuff's got to get turned in. Yeah. Any other questions? Do you from want more questions? One more. You had mentioned, and I think aptly, that uh, security doesn't really fit into the Agile framework. I was curious if you have any tips or practical advice for explaining and working with teams to help them better understand that it doesn't fit that way. So I like that question because it it's not just a security issue that we're all dealing with here. It is more of an organizational issue because we're not the only ones feeling that pain. We don't think that we're the only ones feeling that pain, and we can see other organizations or other teams also feeling the same pains, and like we all kind of have to commiserate together in order to figure out how to fix them. I mean, let's be honest, in the cybersecurity engineering side of this, where you're at building solutions, like we're a support function. If it's not a network that you're building, we're a support function for this airplane that's being built. So like we're not the most important thing, and that that kind of becomes like the issue in Agile of, all right, like you want me to get my tickets done, but this is going to take six months. Well, I, I need you to fit it into a neat little four-week block. All right, cool. There's a phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four, phase five, phase six, phase seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Ticket for this, and I'll show you what the progress is. But that's as far as I can give you. And this is a six-month thing, and you want to see something in four weeks. That's what we've done. Is we've Phase tickets. Yep. That's one of our that's one of our workarounds, I should say, for Agile. Thank you, guys. Great talk. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Thank you everyone, for coming.